Okay, let's resume this afternoon's session. We are happy to have here Matthew Cockrell from Biomed Central. Matthew trained as a biochemist and he was involved in the development of BiomedNet and then after he became editor of Biomed Central. As geographical links, I put Cambridge where you have studied and that seems that I thought that you went to Cold Spring Arbor and Woodsall for a few periods of time and of course London where you now work. As put as BioLinks, Tim Hunt with Wood, he worked as a biochemist and of course Vitek which created Biomed Central. And one thing I want to say, when we invited Vitek for this talk and he desperately didn't want to come because he says it doesn't give good talks and so on, so the idea was to, I mean, show, I mean, or important, I mean, journals and ideas about how to publish things are for field. We already heard about Rich Robert uh, t telling us about open access and how, I mean, he feel about it. and. Basically, this is for us, I mean, uh, in the database world, I mean, open access and access to all of the journals has been completely a revolution. I mean, uh, the fact that we can have access to all of these sorts of information, that we can store those PDF files, that we can mine it, makes a huge difference to everyone. And, of course, journals are becoming more and more like database, and databases are becoming more and more like journals. So, and one of the person, I think, which has been... I mean, one of the groups of people which have been really instrumental into this are Vitek and Matthew with all of the things they did in current science, which is now called Science Navigation Group. And so there's a lot of things they did together, and uh, one of it now being Biomed Central. So thanks, Matthew. Um, thanks a lot, Amos. Um, the first thing I want to say on behalf uh, of VTech is um, to thank Amos for the invitation to speak here. Um, VTech and I both met Amos for the first time more than 10 years ago, and I think we recognized a, uh, a kindred spirit in terms of his kind of quest to um, organize biological knowledge. And it's very much fitted in with what we've been trying to do at Science Navigation Group in terms of science publishing for the last um, more than 10 years. Um, in fact, it started to come to fruition in the last year or two um, as we've uh, recently started a new company, Current Biodata, which um, I'm proud to say, given the displays of Swiss, Swiss nationalism earlier, has got an office in Geneva and is working very closely with uh, Amos and the SwissProt folk to develop um, database services built on the SwissProt Foundation um, to deliver to the pharmaceutical industry in particular areas. But today, rather than talking about that, I'm going to talk more generally about the, um, the future of the scientific publication, uh, how it seems to be evolving, and the important role of open access in making that evolution possible. Um, I wanted to start off with what I think is a really nice quote just from um, last month from the Washington Post. Um, where the columnist says, there's nothing more amusing than watching business interests work themselves up into a righteous frenzy over a threat to their monopoly profits from a new technology or some upstart with a different business model. Invariably, the monopolists try to present themselves as champions of the consumer or defenders of a level playing field, as if they hadn't become ridiculously rich by sticking it to consumers and enjoying years in which the playing field was tilted to their advantage. And the Amusing thing from my perspective on this is that this has nothing to do with open access or science publications. This is talking about the music industry. But it's really striking that the disruptive effect of the internet has created many of the same interesting developments and reactions in many different industries. Um, so it probably is appropriate for me to give you a bit of an update on where things stand in terms of open access. Um, so we started by Med Central as one of the first open access publishers. Everything which we publish would be, as research, would be fully open access in early 2000. And uh, the progress has essentially been accelerating ever since. And what we've really started to see in the last year or so is that the debates and the words and the words of support 
um, from various organizations have started to be replaced by real actions. And so in the last couple of months, we've seen in the UK the, um, the research councils, the one of the major government funders in the UK, issuing policies where they're actually not just suggesting, but requiring the open access deposit of any research which is taking their funds. And so there's a recognition now on behalf of institutions and funders that ultimately they hold the cards. They're the ones paying for the research and they don't have to be told what to do by the traditional publishers. And as a result of that, with that support from funders, it's becoming possible for open access journals to grow and to scale because the, uh, the, those funders are now putting the money, their money where their mouth is and actually making funds available to make it possible for open access journals to grow. Um, and we're seeing that in terms of our own growth and lots of the springing up of many other new open access journals and, and new open access publishers and also the increasing number of conversions of journals to the open access model. Um, in the early days, one of the major criticisms of uh, open access was that for various reasons, open access would clearly not be compatible with high quality publications of the type that subscription journals could deliver. And it's been very useful to be able to d demonstrate via impact factors, however imperfect they are as a metric, that the argument that open access implies low quality just holds no water whatsoever. And I would argue that in the position we are right now, the move towards open access is clearly accelerating and is clearly inevitable and it's now a matter of planning as to what to do and what becomes possible based on that open access model of scientific communication. Just in terms of those issues of growth and of quality, um, this is just for example with Biomed Central, a graph since we started accepting submissions to our journals in or, um, mid 2000s this is just the trend in the monthly submissions and as you can see it's a pretty good approximation still to an exponential curve uh, doubling just over every 18 months and so right now we are continuing to um, to grow at a rapid rate but as we're growing that doesn't reflect uh, a decrease in standards or a decrease in quality um, the, the recent impact factors for the biomedical journals showed uh, across the board on average an improvement in the average impact factor and the first impact factor for a journal like Genome Biology was 9.71 which is a very very impressive and respectable impact factor in its field. It makes it uh, for example fourth of 139 journals in a major field within ISI's track list. So the argument that open access journals are fundamentally not capable of delivering quality has pretty much been shown to be untrue. So if we take this um, prediction in terms of the growth of open access um, as read, what does that really mean for the, um, the future of the scientific article? Um, and I think to make sense of that, it's useful to look back at what the motivation was when we started Biomed Central. Why did we start an open access publisher? Why was it necessary for science to switch from the traditional model, which had worked for hundreds of years, towards a new model, in the age of the internet and the genome. So there are various reasons that make a lot of sense. Um, firstly, having limited access to research articles simply makes research less efficient. If people have to struggle and go th jump through hoops to get access to research, it holds them back from doing the future research. So that's an inefficient use of research funding. That's especially true in um, areas where increasingly people need to have access to disciplines, not just within their own discipline, but also to know what's going on in other disciplines to um, take advantage of that. The traditional model of silos of access to just, you know, subscribing to the journals in your specific field does not encourage that type of cross-fertilization. It's also true to say that this whole model of limiting access and charging for subscriptions simply doesn't fit with the fundamental um, goal of an author, which is for their research to be as widely accessible as possible to get cited as much as possible, and therefore to give them as much credit as possible for the research that they've done. So it's simply, if there, if there is an alternative which gives universal distribution, that has to be more desirable. Um, and lastly, there's the non-trivial point that the traditional scientific publishing model under which publishers have essentially a monopoly on every individual article, and if you want that article, you have to come to them, doesn't function well as a market because you can't go to a different publisher and say I want that article. The other publisher has the monopoly. And so there's 
an argument for saying we need a better model which has a, a, a and which can offer a more efficient service with um, more realistic prices. The thing is, those none of those were the main reason we started Biomed Central. The main reason we started Biomed Central is that with the flood of data that's being generated in the genomic age, there is simply no way for humans to make sense of the whole of the literature that's being published as it's being published. It's very inefficient to keep redoing research because you don't realize that somebody else has kind of found out the same thing but in, a, in an obscure context. And people are not able necessarily to um, synthesize and draw conclusions for how different bits of knowledge published in different areas fit together because nobody can actually read all that literature and understand it all. And so publications and data are increasingly a continuum rather than separate things. Publications embed data, publications refer to data, and publications, in a sense, the content of, of those publications is raw data that can be mined in various ways. So in the future, to make sense of this huge flood of data being delivered by high throughput techniques and by genomic level techniques, there's a need to have really good tools to analyze the results, to analyze the reported scientific knowledge. Uh, and there's also a need to make sure that the widest possible collection of that raw material is widely available to, to be mined for that knowledge. Um, and we have evidence, really, of the benefits of open access to raw material in terms of stimulating innovation. We have the example of the human genome and the vast number of different tools and different algorithms and different techniques that have been developed for mining DNA and protein sequence and structure because the raw data for that, as a matter of policy, has all been made universally accessible. And we can also see the innovation that's happened on the World Wide Web because the large number of web servers making web pages freely available has allowed many different companies and many different individuals to explore different algorithms for searching and for linking between different websites. The problem with the uh, traditional publishing model is that every individual publisher uh, aims to be a benevolent dictator in a way and to say, we'll develop some exciting tools for you which will work with our content. And there's no way that that can actually deliver the quality and variety of tools that can be delivered if the raw material is openly accessible. So in terms of the future of the scientific article, what I'm saying is that in the future we have to think in terms of the, the readers of the scientific article being computers every bit as much as humans. Perhaps computers will be the more important readers of the average scientific article. Um, so what does that mean? Um, at a basic level, we can talk about text mining. We can talk about saying, okay, if you have all these, um, all these articles, if they're freely available in full text form, ideally with some structure in terms of just the basic structure of the article to know what's in which part of the article, then you can start to apply techniques to them, not just simply plain text search, but also m more advanced techniques. And Biomed Central has, right since when we started, made available the enti entirety of our corpus of published research available as XML, so, and it's been used widely by many different groups, commercial and non-commercial, to develop and compare different text mining techniques. Um, we also think it's very important that we don't simply stop at saying, representing the structure of the layout of the article in, in XML terms. We, we see it as very important to progressively add more unambiguous structured information into the article itself, into the published article, to provide a, um, a richer raw material to be mined without so many of the natural language ambiguities that cause errors and problems in interpretation. Now, in terms of what you can do with um, structured research, there are already some examples based on some very simple types of structure, primarily bibliographic structure, or, and also linking structure, of what's being done on the web to provide a picture of interesting scientific research in particular fields. So to give a couple of examples, um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with postgenomic.com. Uh, um, this aggregates information from many different um, RSS feeds and blogs, all in relation to peer-reviewed published scientific articles. And so what it can tell is it, quite complementarily to things like uh, Web of Science, say, which will tell you years after the event which articles have been most cited. A system like Postgenomic can tell you weeks after an article has been published which articles have been linked to on the majority on, on most blogs, and it's all fully you know it's all fully automatic. It's all just running on a little PC under somebody's desk. 
um, but it's the sort of thing that becomes possible as you start to add structure to, uh, to content and make it available. Similarly, there are websites like Sites You Like that, again, are based on structured bibliographic information and about identifying for any given article um, its bibliographic identity using things like PubMed identifiers, DOIs, so it knows when one person is talking about an article and somebody else is talking about an article. And what Site You Like does is it's like a... Um, a web-based equivalent of EndNote in some way. You can archive links to your um, favorite articles and tag them in a, in a certain way. But you can also share those um, bibliographic links with others, and so you can get an overall picture of what other people who have, are interested in articles related to your articles are also interested in. So it's a kind of social networking thing, but which can alert you to, um, to relevant articles. And it's all just based on bibliographic information. But I think that because scientists are very familiar with the, uh, the unit of a bibliographic record, if you like, a, uh, whether it's a photocopy or an entry in a card index, it's quite a useful metaphor for um, aggregating the, the scientific knowledge that relates to your particular area of interest. So what I can imagine is that as well as, instead of assembling your own kind of filing cabinet full of photocopies of articles, you can start to assemble your own online collection of um, bibliographic references, which as more and more structure and more and more knowledge-based structure is added to those uh, articles, you start to have this um, online compilation of biological knowledge which represents your area of interest, and there are many different useful things you can do with that. Um, so a critical part of that is figuring out ways to enrich the raw material with unambiguous semantic information. So it's computer readable, and that computers can do something meaningful with it. Um, something I'll come on to talk about later is that ideally the best place to capture that unambiguous semantic, un semantic information is at the time of authoring. Because if somebody's writing an article, then by the time they've buried something in, in, unambiguous, in ambiguous English, it's then um, a difficult computational task to disambiguate it back into an unambiguous reference. And so the ideal is, uh, is to capture that structure at author time, um, but it's a very non-trivial thing to achieve. In the meantime, um, mining of the free text is very important as a starting point or as a stopgap. Um, and it's also very important to bear in mind that it's not just the text of articles which needs semantically enhancing. The majority of all articles published with Biomed Central include data sets too, or include supplementary material files too. And nearly always right now, those take the form of things like Excel spreadsheets or plain text files or uh, proprietary binary file formats. And none of those things are easily reusable. None of, none of those things have a standardized semantic representation. And so it's important that both the, the text of the article and also the, the data sets associated with articles, and also data sets and databases, start to have more unambiguous uh, semantic tagging associated with them. And the good news, although it's taken, is taking a long time and it's by no means reached um, its goal yet, is that the kind of standards necessary to make this happen are gradually emerging. So it's an area of some controversy, but RDF is one of the most important areas for this. It's... Um, regarded by Tim Berners-Lee, certainly, as the foundation for a future semantic web. And its, um, and its most basic level is about representing knowledge in the form of triples uh, coupling two different entities together with a relationship. Um, and the most important thing in that sense is that both the, the entities and the relationship have unambiguous uh, URIs associated with them. Um, and what's started to evolve are uh, the right kind of tools that allow people to actually work with this kind of RDF-represented knowledge. So at MIT, there's a project called the Simile Project, which has been developing all kinds of different tools for working with RDF, one of which is quite a nice Firefox plugin called Piggybank, which lets you surf the web, and as you go, if any page either has embedded RDF or if they have a filter for that page, which will converse the content on that page into some unambiguous RDF, you can capture that and store it in what's called a triple store, or effectively a bank to store semantically expressed knowledge. And this is all quite um, early day techie stuff. It's not really ready for the average scientist by any means. But in terms of the basic standards and the basic technologies, they're starting to reach a basic level of maturity. Um, so in terms of what type of things 
the tagging um, or would ideally be captured unambiguously. Uh, we heard a little bit about this um, with respect to gene ontology yesterday. Uh, gene ontology certainly has got a long way along this route of identifying many different areas of uh, scientific and uh, specifically biological areas where we need to unambiguously identify um, entities. Um, but it's important to recognize that there are a lot of other not scientifically specific things which are very important to capture unambiguously. Uh, it can be as simple as the identity of a person and knowing that this John Smith is not the same as that John Smith uh, and also places, organizations um, to actually capture um, unambiguously the fact that this thing was done by the Medical Research Council and that's the UK Medical Research Council not the South African Medical Research Council. These are all non-trivial things um, which aren't specifically scientific but are just to do with um, adding semantics to, to knowledge. Now in some ways the, um, one of the handicaps in the early days of the evolution of the semantic web has been the, the profusion of ontologies left, right and centre as everybody recognised the benefits of being able to create their own ontology and in theory the fact that all those ontologies could ultimately be mapped to one another so let a thousand flowers bloom. The problem really is that in the absence of any common hubs to, um, to map things to uh, it's almost impossible to, to, to make sense of things when you have a combinatorial explosion. And so I think it's been a very important development with the setting up in the US of the National Center for Biomedical Ontology, which is trying to bring a certain degree of order to the chaos in identifying some best, pra best practices for ontology structure and also identifying some recommended ontologies in particular areas. And I think as a critical mass of applications start to use some of these standardized ontologies, um, we'll see things start to really take off. Uh, a lot of, in a lot of cases, rather than trying to come up with something brand new and define that as the standard, it makes much more sense to identify de facto standards. And so, for example, with respect to identifying proteins, the Uniprot identifier serves as a, a great example of an unambiguous um, semantic reference. Um, just wanted to give one example of the type of semantic enrichment that goes on and that can be done using the raw material of uh, open access research. This is actually using um, some semantic tagging software from Dietrich Rebholz's lab at the EBI. Uh, and this is actually a very competitive field. There are lots of different um, tools being developed for, um, for mining text and attempting to unambiguously recognize entities. And um, one of the great things about open access corpuses, corpora, is that you can compare different tools because everybody has access to the same um, raw material. And in fact, that's what's being done by um, the Neuro Commons project, which is part of Science Commons, also part of Creative Commons. Um, and they're working with a subset of neuro, yeah, neuroscience-related data from Biomed Central and Public Library of Science. And they're comparing various different text mining approaches uh, in order to enrich those articles semantically. They're trying to also identify best practices in terms of standard ontologies and to use a combination of text mining approaches and human annotation to create some kind of gold standard for what ideally we would try to achieve with future scientific articles. Um, and for the long term, that project sees one of its goals also to, to work on enhancing the tools used by authors to, um, to help authors to capture that information as they go. Uh, just to quickly mention, so I haven't got much time, um, the role of wikis. One of the big challenges with ontologies is that these entities we're talking about, scientific research is always coming up with new things. And so to maintain a hierarchical classification of various kinds of control vocabulary, the problem is always going to be that it's out of date or it needs maintenance or it needs reorganization. Uh, and that was another thing that was discussed in the context of gene ontology yesterday. And Berent Mons, I know, gave a talk. Uh, mentioning wikis, I think wikis potentially have a very important role, not just in actually annotating content, but also in the maintenance of ontologies to make sure that they stay up to date enough to allow them to be used to fully annotate scientific research. Uh, one just very simple example of where it really seems to be almost the only way to scale is if you need to disambiguate which author is which, and basically every new article that's published, you have to say, does this article go with that John Smith or this John Smith? You can do it algorithmically to a certain degree of accuracy, but somebody's going to have to say, actually, no, that article is misclassified. It, goes from, it shouldn't go with this John Smith. It, it's one of mine. And wikis seem a very natural way to make that possible and scalable. 
Um, just to mention a few practical areas where we're starting to actually work on adding structure to, um, to scientific articles. Case reports is one example. They're traditionally viewed as somewhat um, dull because any individual case report doesn't tell you that much. On the other hand, if you can capture enough structured information for a very large number of case reports, you have a database which will start to show you correlations or patterns or new things happening that can really identify the uh, early stages of some new medical phenomenon. And that case reports are where lots of new important medical stuff gets found out. And having good case report databases based on good structured case report publications could really help there. Similarly, with clinical trials, in an ideal world, you would like to have the data from all clinical trials available in such a structured, semantically rich form that you can easily compile meta-analyses on the fly and know that they're meaningful. We're a long way away from that, but there are projects like Global Trial Bank aiming to achieve that, and we're collaborating with those projects. We have the, um, the Targeted Protein Journal and Database, which is working in collaboration with SwissProt to try and capture, in a standard form, information about protein, structure, protein function. And so we'll have, again, more structured articles to capture that in a, in a, in a way that makes it easier for it to flow into a database. Um, in terms of the chemistry journals we publish, we're seeking to capture reliably things like the INCHI identifiers to always have for the small molecules the type of structure information right from the word go, rather than having to reverse engineer that and add it back after publication. And um, we're also working with some groups who are interested in publications related to new species and taxonomy because taxonomy is a very kind of stereotypical area. Every article reporting a new species takes a very standard form. It's just crying out to be made into a database. But that doesn't really happen yet, and we're, we're going to work to make that happen. So very quickly, my last point is on the, the, the challenge of structured authoring. It would be great to have structured authoring, and we did a very interesting collaboration with Wolfram Research, um, the makers of Mathematica. And they have created a tool called Publicon, which is an authoring tool built on the Mathematica engine that um, is capable of creating a fully structured scientific article, including equations, all, all of which um, can be easily created by the user. And then you can press a button, and out will come Biomed Central XML with MathML for all the equations. And that MathML being possible to just cut and paste into any other application. Um, problem is, the structure to be added there. This is work for the author. And in practice, you, you have the benefits of structure. For example, you take the article. And you can see it has a rich equation in it. And you can cut and paste that equation because it's MathML. It came straight through from the author's desktop through to the publisher. There's no chance of any errors being introduced. Um, the problem is the author has to do the work. Is it worth their while? Um, so what can you do about that? The ideal world is that you do things in such a way that adding structure is actually less work for the author than not adding structure. And that's why EndNote works. Because of the way that journals make it difficult for you by having to reformat your references, it's actually easier to put the stuff into EndNote in a structured way and then reformat it rather than doing it manually. That's the ideal. If you can't do that, what you need to be able to try and do is give the author an immediate return on their investment for having structured the article. And on the simplification angle, the sim an obvious suggestion for how to make the author's work less is also suggest. You already have that in your mail program. You know if you type Tom, it'll give you a list of the Toms who you've previously used and who you've mailed to. So being able to help people when they're typing to disambiguate and to also complete the entities they want to refer to will help them to be accurate in their use of nomenclature. This is already standard in um, programming. If you're typing away in your integrated uh, development environment, it'll do this. We need to have this in biology as well. The last slide, um, in terms of the alternative, in terms of providing authors with immediate feedback, there are examples you can think of, like if you add structure to clinical trial data, to be able to give somebody an immediate view on an updated meta-analysis based on their clinical trial data, that would be adding value. Um, in terms of case reports, if somebody submits a, a structured case report, being able to give somebody immediate feedback on the related case reports and how that case report fits in statistically to the existing case reports. And in the case of, for example, reporting a new species, being able to have that new species automatically get deposited in some standard registry. All these are types of things you can do to try and motivate authors to, to, to use structure. But it's not going to be simple, and I think that's going to be one of the big challenges going forward, is how can we put tools in the hands of authors to create the structure that we can then use to mine and represent biological knowledge. Thanks. Okay, so we have time for, I think, one quick question. Okay. Um, 
Do you? Chris? If the authors, I mean, you and I have talked about this before, and, and in fact, I have, a, I have a proposal that, that I will make next week uh, within the scientific community about author entry of facts tailored to the kind of science we do here. Uh, but but the, the, my question is that, that, that if you have author entry of, 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 of information and you try to write incentives and so on, we're wonderful, of course, because they're the primary source. And of course, one of the posters here, in fact, had that on it, where one of the SwissProt posters were rather than going to a published paper and back into SwissProt annotation, go directly into the database and they call it adopt a gene or adopt a protein or something. Yeah. So the yeah, the years are out there. So my, my particular question has to do with with how to make that work in a commercial environment and the subtlety, imagine that takes off. The subtlety of doing that in an open access publishing world versus in the Elsevier world. Would author submission of facts that go into databases be able to exist in both, and how do you see that? I think there are some areas here where exactly that. There's a, there can be a challenge if the publisher sees the research and sees the, um, the knowledge that's being entered into these databases or the article themselves as being their property, then there are challenges with saying, can that property be just directly modified by somebody here or there? If, on the other hand, the publisher is serving as a, in an open access model, the publisher is a kind of conduit. It's, they're, they're a pipeline through which research goes and which the peer review happens and, it, and, and the quality control happens. Then that's, the research then goes on to a life of itself, which the publisher doesn't try to completely control and doesn't commercially own. You know, the future of the, the evolution and the incremental improvement of that content is entirely compatible with the, the open access model of providing the service. Okay, I can see there are other people who wish to ask questions. Could you speak uh, direct to Matthew after the session, please? So thanks again, Matthew.